very much. And uh, thanks to the organisers uh, for this chance uh, to allow us to consider the death penalty in our region today. And may I also say uh, it's an honour uh, to speak at a conference named after one of our greatest barristers, Ron Caston. Uh, and it's an honour uh, to speak with Mariam and to reflect on her personal uh, courage, which I'm sure we'll do long after today. I propose to look at two countries, Indonesia and the Philippines, and consider the politics of executing. Uh, sadly, the logic of executions uh, in our region, if not everywhere, but in our region, is political gain. It's as brutal and simple as that. Sounds fun. <laughs> uh, uh, we can't talk about every country in Asia in such a short time. There are countries where there's the status quo, uh, where not much is changing, such as Singapore, Malaysia, Japan, China. Uh, there are other countries where there's a lot happening, such as the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, uh, Brunei. Uh, there are countries with no transparency. Uh, China, who is of course the greatest executioner in the world. Uh, a few weeks ago in Oslo, I was in a room full of experts, uh, trying to, and they were talking about how many people does China execute in a particular year. Uh, even the experts gathered from around the world really didn't know. Um, but the numbers were so wide that it was astonishing. The range was between three and 6,000 for people in the room. Um, in Indonesia, we're promised uh, mass, mass executions within weeks, if not days, uh, and dozens more after that when they can be arranged, whatever that means. In the Philippines, we're promised uh, in the near future executions, perhaps even by the thousands, uh, in the words of the news president. And as I uh, shall demonstrate, uh, he has form in this area. Uh, perhaps to try and frame what I'm going to talk about, uh, when we look at recent events and political messages in countries ranging from Egypt to Pakistan to Turkey, across to Indonesia and the Philippines, uh, for some reason the death penalty is part of a, a growing zeitgeist, which gets talked about a lot these days. It means many different things, but it includes uh, the venting of anger and fear, the, the desire to be seen as tough and merciless. And when we zero in on the death penalty, we always see the political gain to be had by pushing the resurgence of the death penalty back onto a local political agenda. There's no doubt that there's an increased willingness to kill in the world and talk of killing from too many governments. That's not all gloom and doom. There are many governments that don't do this, and uh, many governments that go, don't go down this path or don't go back to this path. And just thinking of a few of them in recent, in the last 10 or 11 years, uh, Norway, um, Belgium, France, England have all had atrocities, but they're not talking about going back to the death penalty. And there are other countries in our region, such as Thailand and to a lesser extent Malaysia, which are clearly talking about moving away from the death penalty. So it's not all doom and gloom. Um, today's talk, I'm not really going to be talking about solutions so much. Um, I'm interested in identifying problems. Uh, you're a room full of problem solvers and advocates, uh, so I want to identify some problems and uh, in different ways some of us will work on solving those problems. And I should emphasise, I'm not interested in criti criticising Indonesia. Um, certainly criticising it for its own sake. I really do love much about that country after having been there so many times. Um, but uh, the system is flawed and criticism is needed. In 2014, election campaign of uh, Joko Widodo, there was no campaign theme of executing drug prisoners. In fact, the human rights lobby uh, backed uh, Joko Widodo heavily. They saw him as a new agent of change for better in the country. But within weeks of taking office, he was struggling. Uh, the sheen very quickly wore off as he struggled dealing with the forces that were arraigned around him. Uh, within eight weeks, it seems, therefore, both he and the Attorney General were suddenly talking of executions, in particular drug offenders. Uh, and then from December 2014, he became president in October 2014, the announcement was regularly repeated that all the 64 drug offenders on death row would be executed. 
very strangely, there was no apparent understanding um, by government that many of those um, prisoners still had legal options before them in the courts and that many, if not most of the condemned, were still able to file clemency applications to the president. Uh, that just went by the by. So the sad truth is the rule of law was quickly shaken. Of course not destroyed, but shaken. There just was no pretense that the merits of any particular case would be considered. Indeed, uh, within the numerous applications that we lawyers for Andrew Chan and Moses Sukumaran were soon to make, was the, a challenge to the apparent failure of the new president even to read and consider the detailed applications for clemency which were on his desk when he took office. By December 2014, he was saying, I will reject clemency. I will reject clemency requests submitted by the 64 death row inmates. This rejection of clemency will be important shock therapy for drug dealers and traffickers. Uh, and going back before that, most unfortunately, the previous president, uh, Susilo Bangbang Udiono, had failed to consider the clemency applications which sat on his desk for a couple of years, despite the legal time frames. So that was December 2014, the, bang, the drum was banging, and then within uh, a few weeks, six people were executed on the 18th of January, despite urgent interventions uh, at many levels, including from heads of state around the world. And with those executions, there were some very strong criticisms from civil society within Indonesia and from parts of the media, but nevertheless, the killings were locally, politically deemed a success. Uh, five of the six who were killed were foreigners. Given the international efforts that went into stopping that, uh, it was apparent that the usual avenues of international friendship and diplomacy were insufficient to outweigh what was suddenly the new political imperative. And for us lawyers acting for Sukumar and Chan, uh, clemency had become sidelined uh, into which so many years of effort had been poured. And so suddenly there was only the legal option. Um, and despite our efforts in four courts in as many months, uh, the merits of our applications were never actually considered, only um, jurisdiction was considered. And on the 29th of April, eight more people were executed. Uh, seven of them were foreigners. And again, the execution seemed to be locally a political success. And the media was, uh, in analysing all of the efforts of the new president, was saying, if we list all the big issues of the day, and they would list half a dozen of the big issues of the day, the president is failing on all of them, except one, and that is public support for executions. Um, however, uh, international condemnation really was very strong. It gradually became apparent that the so-called plans to execute many more in the near future were suddenly put on the back burner. Prior to the executions of Sukumar and Chan and the other six on that day, the Attorney General had already been talking about plans for the so-called third wave of executions. Um, that was in April last year, there had been none since, so of course it didn't happen. Uh, and that, in my opinion, is for political reasons. But looking at what did happen in terms of governance, international reputation, and building confidence in the rule of law, uh, it was a train wreck. The Attorney General has said that he budgets $20,000 for each execution. Uh, so there's been nothing really that's changed in any significant way since April of last year to stop a whole lot more executions, but they haven't proceeded for 15 months. And overwhelmingly, this suggests that there are unstated political considerations which guide the process. Actually, the politicians do not say that, they talk about um, why that is the case is really never properly explained. All through this year, executions have been imminent, all through this year, and then delayed. There can be little doubt that the inconsistency in government policy, where there is work which is excellent done overseas by Indonesia, which is set off against the dreadful work of killing in Indonesia itself, reveals when analysed that the whole debate is uh, purely political. So for the last five years, since 2011, Indonesia has had an aggressively progressive and excellent strategy of working in countries around the world to save its own citizens on death row. There is probably no other country in the world as successful 
or determined and hard-working as Indonesia in saving its own citizens on death row from around the world. In fact, a few weeks ago, the Foreign Ministry announced that it had so far since 2011 saved 285 citizens from death row in the last five years. And that's fantastic. Why are they doing that? Because in 2011, an Indonesian maid was brutally and callously executed by the Saudis in Saudi Arabia, and the country of Indonesia was enraged. And the politics of rage have been simple. The Indonesians simply will not tolerate or sit back and watch while one of their own are executed if they can do anything to stop it. And I applaud that. It's a wonderful achievement and I often praise Indonesia for it. But it must be noted that a large number of those people uh, overseas who have been rescued and who remain on death row, who are Indonesians, are in fact for drug cases. So if an Indonesian is caught in Indonesia doing a serious drug crime which can lead to execution, and sentenced to death, it would seem he can expect little mercy, he or she. But if he's doing the same crime overseas, uh, the government will quite rightly spend money, employ lawyers and do whatever it can diplomatically to come to the rescue. So we can't pretend that it's not about politics. There's an entirely different approach taken at home, especially when it concerns foreigners, as the statistics reveal. It's impossible to reconcile all this, except through the prism of seeing that what matters is domestic politics. Through that uh, political prism of domestic politics, we often have a fairly debased debate. Uh, last year, the head of BNN, the anti-narcotics agency, said that he was considering a policy to force feed drug dealers their drugs until they died, or to lock them on an island surrounded by alligators and piranhas and just leave them there with their drugs and their animals to kill them. Now we all know that Indonesia has huge, uh, huge national problems, but we see that drugs and execution are being repeated again and again as the biggest issue of the day. It's a sure way to distract from other problems, the underlying issues of poverty, systematic corruption, which Indonesians themselves complain so much about, the failure of government in terms of poor infrastructure, education, literacy, and so on. All these things are, of course, highly relevant to young people getting caught up in drugs, usually the poor and disenfranchised. The important issues just get buried under the sloganeering. In that context of that debate, uh, cruelty does emerge, for instance, all through the year we've been told people are going to be executed soon, um, but the Attorney General never names them. No one knows who they are. So if you're on death row, um, you don't know at any time this year, indeed since April last year, at any time since April last year, you don't know whether you're going to live for a few days or a few years. Uh, it really is scandalous. I say a few days because the law requires 72 hours notice. What we can predict with some firmness, I would suggest, is that those who will be killed soon, uh, the number of 15 or 18 kids get banning about at the moment, well, will mostly be foreigners and they'll mostly come from countries where people are already executed, such as China, Nigeria, Pakistan and so on and no doubt a number of other poor African countries where governments can be uh, expected to say or do little or nothing in opposition to the executions. And by doing it in that way, the Indonesian government will obtain maximum local political advantage by killing and minimum international concern. Indeed, the government has said a number of times they wish to, at this time, avoid a soap opera, which is what happened last time. But the soap opera, of course, was entirely of its own making. Who can forget the extraordinary circuits of moving the two peaceful Australians, Sukumaran and Chan, from Bali to Nusikambangan? Fighter jets armed with missiles, armoured personnel carriers, hundreds of heavily armed men and so on. Now the justification for all of this is a drugs crisis. How the drug problem compares to other countries or what's really happening is not really known. Experts have certainly debunked the statistics used by the government. Um, you could start, if you wanted to read about that, in the Lancet of June 2015. There's not much information around. But what we do know from the head of the Anti-Narcotics Agency, BNN, is that uh, by the end of last year, 2015, the number of drug users had significantly increased in the second half of the year. 
Well, for me to put that another way, executions clearly, as we all know anyway, have zero deterrence effect. The drug problem is unaffected by such executions. Uh, there is a way forward, and surely it's to assist Indonesia as much as possible in fighting its drug problems, to move the debate uh, away from the kind of debate that people like me have been caught up in to a much broader, more positive debate of working to assist Indonesia to work against the drug problem, which is of course real there as in most other countries. So it would be great if the uh, EU and regional countries in friendship with Indonesia, such as Australia and others, would help it more to fight uh, the drug problems that it faces with concerted Indonesian and international efforts to tackle the use and abuse of drugs, to understand and treat the causes of use and increased use, maximise medical and treatment pathways, focus on health and rehabilitation, not crime and punishment. The second way forward must include the scholars of both law and Islam setting out the arguments that have been employed in Indonesia uh, to consider those arguments in the context of abolition in the unique cultural setting. But meanwhile, the spectre of increased uh, executions continues to grow. Uh, each new and ugly crime in Indonesia now uh, sparks calls for more executions. In May, a child was raped, a terrible crime. Uh, so the president promised death penalty for child rapists. Uh, this week there's been a scandal concerning fake vaccines so that corrupt fraudsters can make money. Uh, people are now calling for their execution and there have been other examples. Uh, David McRae, who's a scholar that some of you may know, uh, in analysing this question of how the president has treated the uh, executions and made it uh, so political, notes that former cabinet ministers um, have warned against the government's strategy of talking up the executions because uh, as one of the former foreign ministers has said, it gives the world the impression that the government of Indonesia is enjoying the spectacle of the executions. Uh, so my comments on Indonesia before I turn briefly to the Philippines are pretty tough, I know. Um, there's much room for debate and change. Uh, and I really hope that with people like you and the institutions you come from, we can see much greater engagement between Indonesia and its friends such as Australia working towards uh, abolition and for Indonesia to be a champion in the region of both um, democracy and human rights. I'll, I'll speak much more briefly on the Philippines, but given events of recent weeks, we really ought to deal with it a bit. The new President Duterte, uh, under his lead up to being uh, inaugurated and under his leadership, both the death penalty and extrajudicial killings in the Philippines are well and truly back on the agenda. And the new Vice President is clearly strongly opposed to the death penalty and has spoken out already in recent days against the growing culture of vigilantism and violence. Uh, so I can't say where the debate is going to go. There are senators opposed to the introduction of the new bill. Uh, so there is a debate that's going to happen. The ICJ, International Commission of Jurists, only a week or so ago wrote a letter to the President saying, please, adhere to the rule of law. So just think about that. That's what's already been implored of, of the new President by international agencies. Please, look at the rule of law. Uh, and that's because of the immediate spike in recent times of extrajudicial killings. Uh, between 30 June and 11 July, there were at least 136 extrajudicial killings in the Philippines. So extrajudicial in this context means at arrest, and what is being said is that people are said to be resisting arrest and just get executed, or alternatively people are being found dead in the street with placards around their necks saying, don't be a criminal like me. So in 10 days at the beginning of this month, there are 136, and media is now reporting between the beginning of this month and today, there's in excess of 250 such extrajudicial killings. Um, now, the death penalty in the Philippines is unusual. It was um, part of the Marcos era and before Marcos. You remember that Marcos ended in 1986, but in his whole time as president, um, there were only, I think, 31 executions. So, although there were a lot of killings, as a matter of law, there were very few. And in the 40 years before him, there were something like 80 executions, which is, over the history of modern Philippines, it shows that it's not a country, really, that historically 
executes very much. Um, but with the end of the era, as often happens around the world, when there's the end of a, of, a, of a traumatic era, many of these laws change, and the ex, uh, death penalty was abolished in the Philippines in 1987. Uh, but it was reintroduced with the next president in 1992, and put with 12 laws, but as you will know in your work in this area, cancers always grow. So you could get executed for 12 crimes in 1992, by the year 2000 it was more than 50 different crimes. And then with the next president, um, it was, uh, was this not, well, not the next president, it was Australia, but Arroyo, uh, it was abolished again in 2006. But at all times it's remained in the constitution, so it's unable to be enlightened. So it's a different setting than most countries. In the, in Singapore, pardon me, the Philippines have of course since 2007 also signed the ICCPR and the Second Optional Protocol, which many of you will know means that they're committed to abolishing the death penalty not only in their own country but elsewhere. So all through this century in the Philippines up until now, even when the death penalty was on the statute books and it no longer is, people were not being executed and where the penalty was being handed down it was always being stayed or committed. But it stayed on the statute, it stayed in the constitution, which brings us up to now. Uh, the new president was inaugurated at the beginning of this month, and his very first act was to introduce a bill to reactivate the death penalty. Uh, and I started by talking about politics. It's always political. Uh, for 20 years, he was the mayor of Davao, uh, which is the largest city of Mindanao. Uh, before he became president. While he was mayor, it seems that at least a thousand people were murdered by the so-called Davao death squad, uh, seemingly in alliance with police and authority. It seems the killers could expect to be paid a bounty between a hundred and a thousand dollars. He was attacked while he was a mayor by the Manila Times, which condemned the mentality of lawlessness and vigilantism in his city. The paper argued that the culture of impunity enabled those in power, private warlords and businessmen vigilantes, to take retribution against those who they felt acted against their interests, such as journalists exposing corruption, human rights activists and so on. Philip Olsen, who's the United Nations Special Rapporteur at the time in 2009, did a report on, amongst other things, to vow. The mayor, he said, the mayor's positioning is frankly untenable. He dominates the city so thoroughly that he can stand out whole genres of crime. Yet he remains powerless in the face of hundreds of murders committed by men without masks, in the face of many witnesses. Um, the new president at different times has said how many people he's going to kill. At one time he said 100,000 in my first six months. Uh, that's not going to happen. It was seen, but he was elected on a policy of smashing crime. Um, and we have to remember that he was long associated with uh, death squads, uh, allegedly, uh, prior to being elected as president. Uh, Philip Olsen, in his report, said that in 2008, the lonely year that he studied in depth, there were 269 extrajudicial killings in that city of Davao and that the Mayor Duterte's comments on the killing suggested he was supportive of them. Human Rights Watch in 2009 did a huge report on the same situation. I won't go through it now because time is up, but basically it was extremely condemnatory of the Mayor. Called for him to be investigated by the government and so on. Called the international community to investigate him. But uh, that didn't happen and now the Mayor is the President. And so far there have been over 250 extrajudicial killings so far this month. So it can be argued uh, that the words of the new president, which I haven't really gone into much today, but are scandalous, uh, may amount really to giving the green light to judicial, to extrajudicial killings. Uh, time is going to defeat me, so I'm going to wind up. Uh, but I'll finish just by reflecting for a moment on Turkey because one idea I'd like you all to take away is to notice how when there's political change and there's a rise in populism and a rise in demagoguery, a rise in authoritarianism, what we're now seeing 
simultaneously is an interest and a reversion and a support of the death penalty in many places simultaneously around the world. So with the recent coup in Turkey, uh, we saw 2,000 judges dismissed, possibly more than 10,000 people arrested. The figures vary widely, so I've seen figures of 20,000, but I've no idea what the truth is. In the context of that urgent debate that's happening in Turkey, we see demands for the reinstatement of the death penalty. Uh, and many of you will know more about Egypt than I do, but the massive numbers of people being sentenced to death there are a reflection of what's happening in many countries simultaneously. In other countries, the status quo remains the same. Uh, Singapore, Malaysia, China and so on. Uh, there's an increased secrecy we see in countries like that. And let's call it for what it is, it's shame. Uh, shame of what they're doing. Because now instead of the world saying, why shouldn't I execute, which is what the world said in 1947, 8 for instance. Uh, there's so much change has happened in this success story of fighting against the death penalty around the world that now only a small number of countries execute. The question is, how can you continue to execute? Only about 25 countries now execute out of the whole world, regardless of what the law books say. That's what actually happens. Uh, and so the secrecy is shame. Unfortunately, in Brunei, one of our rich, friendly, near neighbours, uh, Sharia law is on the books and it's coming back in in the next year or two in stages and uh, that would lead for executions to be available there within a year or two. Um, wherever you look around the world at death penalty, uh, almost invariably, uh, with very, very few exceptions, uh, capital punishment uh, is for the poor and for the poorly connected. And I'll leave you with a quote I saw recently which certainly caught my eye. Uh, the people who get executed, uh, it said that those without the capital get the punishment. And thank you very much. Uh, Ms. McMahon, thank you for your talk. Uh, earlier this year, the UN had a General Assembly special uh, session on drugs um, in which the leaders of Mexico, Guatemala and Colombia called for a liberalization of um, international standards on drug enforcement. Um, Mexican president said we must move beyond prohibition to effective prevention. Um, and those are the countries which have been hit Can I just ask you to stand up? I just can't see. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, that's it. Okay. I should also say that I actually have very bad hearing in an echo room like this. I'm, I'm struggling to hear your question. Should I start the question again? Yeah, just speak more slowly. Okay. So, earlier this year, the United Nations uh, had a special assembly uh, session uh, which uh, focused on international standards on drug enforcement in which the leaders of Mexico, Guatemala and Colombia, which have been hit hardest by narco-trafficking violence, uh, called for liberalization of international standards. Um, so, for example, the Mexican president called for a move uh, beyond prohibition to effective protect prevention. Um, countries which executed drug smugglers uh, were condemned, while Norway was praised for having a human rights-based approach. Uh, my question uh, with regards, especially to Indonesia, is do you think the international community has a role to play in the broad liberalization of drug policy internationally, and could this see uh, a reduction in the level of state violence towards people convicted of drug offences? Well, certainly the international community has a role to play. Um, hopefully the, the local community has a larger role to play, and that can happen if people like us and the organisations that you all represent um, provide more capacity to local um, speakers and agents and organisations. Uh, you're kind of referring to one of the biggest issues in the world about executions and drugs, which is, you know, how it's time really, I mean, I personally have quite a conservative attitude to drugs, and um, I'm no rap for them at all, but it's time internationally clearly to change the rhetoric. The war on drugs has so self-evidently failed over so long and caused so much harm that the medical approach which is promulgated in countries like Portugal, Switzerland and Northern Europe and so on um, is, is the way the world really has to move otherwise uh, it won't, you know, 
nothing good will come of the strategies because the war on drugs has already been lost and we'll just, it's a question of how much more losing goes on. Uh, so Indonesia is not, has not shown much interest in that debate. Uh, Indonesia is currently regarding drug use as a very serious crime. Uh, so you can read about um, people share needles and hide needles because being caught with a needle will lead you into serious trouble and a possible incarceration and so on. So there's a big cultural and uh, education shift that needs to occur there um, and in various parts of our own country as well, of course. Uh, but the real solution to um, uh, dealing with state violence with regard to drugs and execution in Indonesia is going to be educating enough people in the country to be talking about drugs in a way which is different from talking about the end of the world and unmitigated evil and so on. We have to talk about drugs in a way which a community like in Victoria are much more familiar with, which is as much a social problem and a health problem and causes for why, why young people get caught up in drugs, which might be a combination of poverty, unemployment and many other factors. Uh, that's a big debate and uh, I really think that the universities amongst most institutions have to lead that debate in partnership from, from around the world and just take over the debate in a way. The security agencies have failed. In most countries the politicians have failed uh, to deal with this debate in a way which is going to um, bring long-term solutions. Um, to finish that very long answer, a huge percentage of people in jail in America, of the 2.3 million people in jail in America, are in jail for drug crimes, not for violent crimes. And America has now become the most incarcerated population in the history of the world. So that's where the war on drugs has got us. We need a much smarter answer and dealing with Indonesia in the way you're uh, inferring is part of it. Thank you very much, Mr. Vaughan, for your presentation. I wanted to ask you about your comment regarding Turkey. I'm not sure if you will be able to comment on this, but I'm following with interest the eight soldiers who have defected to Greece at the moment and are currently under an extradition process. I just wondered if you could comment on the extradition laws and how they might operate in this instance particularly given that Turkey is speaking about the reintroduction of the death penalty? Uh, well, I don't know the particular case, but, but and if I look around the room and see lawyers who I fear and respect so much, I'm too scared to answer the question. <laughs> <coughs> Sarah might run up and answer. But uh, I think part of the answer will be uh, the European Union countries are very unlikely to extradite people to a country where they'll be executed. So the lawyers for those eight soldiers will be presumably looking to run that debate right through the European courts. Uh, ultimately that debate I would expect to be successful. I may be wrong about that, but I think that's... Sarah, do you want to... <laughs> <laughs> Turkey, has Turkey hasn't yet put the death penalty back on the yeah. table. I mean, EU can't... Um can't extradite to a country which has the death penalty. And I think that would extend to a country which might be, which is actively talking about it. Um, and, and unless they get assurances that they won't be put to death. So that would be the more obvious thing for Greece to do, to just seek it. Mm. While I've got this... <laughs> uh, I might leave the questions. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, it's, it's again, a, a more personal question, I guess it goes back to um, Andrew Chan and Myron Sukumara and whether you've kept in, in, in touch with the families and, and how are they, you know, one year on, um, um, well, over one year on from what's happening because the world sort of seems like it's moved on but how do you move on from that? Well, I think we're being filmed so I can't talk too much personally about the families. Uh, the families are grieving differently um, and they're just both 
aching in different ways. Uh, no one involved, I would say, is recovered, frankly. Families, lawyers, and some of the other um, workers, chaplains, and so on, who were involved. That's an easy 20 or 30 people. Uh, I would say all of, all of the people involved are seriously wounded, and the families far, far worse than everybody else. Um, that's true of lots of things that people do, but see what happened in that case, which made it more difficult for everybody, is that it just went on and on and on. So instead of finishing in January, uh, which it nearly did, and then it nearly finished in February, uh, it went actually on for months. This is after nine years of a great deal of work. Uh, so you kind of take psychological adjustments thinking the boys are going to be dead in a week, and then it turns out week after week after week we keep fighting and trying to find new ways, uh, and eventually we lost, but I think that did nobody any favours. On the other hand, we do it all again immediately because we nearly won several times along that path and we never knew until the last 72 hours that we were definitely going to lose. Uh, so everyone wounded, it, it kind of just remained extremely intense for such a long time.